What's up guys, I'm Ari Rochelle and this is The End Times. In part 1, we discussed why hell is referred to as the second death. After posting that video, I was genuinely taken aback that someone was arguing that hell isn't the lake of fire or the second death, but instead that hell is the same as Hades. This was due to an inaccurate translation that was followed instead of going back to the original Greek and Hebrew of the words mistranslated in their Bible. So before we get too deep into why hell is called the lake of fire, let's first prove without a shadow of a doubt that hell is in fact the same place as the lake of fire. Hell in the Bible is the Greek word on your screen and it's used 12 times in the New Testament. Hades in the Bible is the Greek word Hades and it's used 10 times in the New Testament. We know that in the Old Testament, Hades is the Hebrew word on the screen, which is the English word Sheol, is used 65 times in the Old Testament. And we can be 100% positive of this because Peter directly quotes David in his Pentecost message after being filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 verse 25 through 28 says, For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. The verse Peter quoted by David was Psalm 16 verse 8 through 11. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken, therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Notice the word Sheol and not hell. This is the Hebrew word that we discussed earlier. Sheol is the realm of the dead, a place where everyone regardless of good or evil went. Paul quotes David and says that Jesus led a host of captives as he ascended into heaven. Ephesians 4 verse 8 and Psalm 68 verse 18. Why do you think this is? He was taking them to heaven from Sheol or Hades to the place he went to prepare for us while we wait for a new home on the new earth where we will dwell with him for all eternity if we will pick up our cross and follow him. John 14 1 through 4 and Revelation 21 1 through 8. When we look at how Jesus referred to hell, it's different than just the realm of the dead. Jesus referred to hell as a place of unquenchable fire. Mark chapter 9 verse 43 And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. Jesus also referred to hell as a place that some people are sentenced to while others are not. Matthew 23 verse 33 You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? No one is sentenced to the realm of the dead. The realm of the dead is the place for all people to go before the resurrection of the dead. It wasn't a sentencing. It's the place the dead are held, both good and evil, which is why a great chasm divides Hades, according to Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31. It's the place that gives up its dead and then is thrown into the lake of fire, Revelation chapter 20 verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Hades is a place that has gates, according to Jesus himself when speaking to Peter. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 NIV And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Almost every translation translates the Greek word Hades here as hell, because each translation is flawed in some shape or form. Why? Because each translation is translated with each translator's own ideas, biases, and interpretations of the original scriptures. This is the importance of not clinging to one specific translation, but to the original scriptures written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. These are what we are to defend and believe without a shadow of a doubt, not someone's translation. Another mistranslation is of Peter's writings, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them 
to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. This word translated here as hell is actually the Greek word on the screen, which literally means to be held captive in Tartarus. The most likely reason the translator translated this word as hell instead of Tartarus is because Tartarus is associated with Greek mythology and they probably feared the same kind of accusation I received when I pointed out that the word Peter used wasn't hell or Hades but Tartarus. When I pointed this out to a commenter on our previous video, I was accused of using another book other than the Bible, then accused of only using the Greek and denying the Hebrew Old Testament. I've noticed that when the Bible directly contradicts what people have made up in their own minds, they will twist any and everything said to them as well as make arbitrary accusations that make absolutely no sense. May God have mercy on your soul. Either we believe all of the Bible as it is written or none of it. We can't cherry pick what we want to believe or what suits our own ideologies. Another differentiation between hell and Hades is that you are brought down to Hades or carried away to Hades, but you are thrown into hell. Luke chapter 16 verse 22 through 26. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you were in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. Hades, according to Jesus himself, housed all of the dead, both righteous and unrighteous. That's why the rich man begged Abraham to have Lazarus dip his finger in water and cool his tongue. But Abraham told him that there was a great chasm dividing the righteous and the unrighteous, and no one could cross from one side to the other. Hell, on the other hand, is a place you are sentenced to because of your actions. It's a place you were thrown or cast into according to Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 5 verse 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Hell is a place you are sentenced and thrown into, not a place your soul goes to simply because you have died. Otherwise, we would need to fear man just as much as we fear God because Jesus made this very clear about the power of God. Matthew chapter 10 verse 28, And do not fear those who killed the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Luke 12 verse 4 through 5, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. If hell is just a place you go when you die, then this argument that Jesus is making for why you should fear God and not man is silly because Anyone who kills you would be sentencing you to hell because that's just the realm of the dead. No, Jesus wasn't talking about the realm of the dead. Jesus was talking about something much worse, something more terrifying than just the realm of the dead. Jesus was talking about a place that was created not for mankind to go when they die, but for the devil and his angels, an unquenchable fire, an eternal flame of torment. Matthew 25 verse 41 says, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. While there are references to an eternal destruction and fire, the word hell isn't actually in the Old Testament. It's a New Testament word given to us as a revelation from Jesus himself. Popular Old Testament verses that are mistranslated as hell are all actually the Hebrew word Sheol, not hell. 
These verses include but aren't limited to Deuteronomy 32, 22, Psalms 9, 17, Psalms 139, verse 8, Proverbs 7, 27, Isaiah 14, verse 9, Ezekiel 31, 16 through 17, Amos 9, verse 2, and Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 5. According to Jesus, hell is the place where the worm doesn't die and the fire isn't quenched. Mark chapter 9, verse 47 through 48. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. This is the same prophecy that Isaiah spoke of that will be for those who are judged at the final judgment and found wanting. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 22 through 24. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. For new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord, and they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. For their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. This isn't the millennial reign of Christ. This is after he makes a new heaven and a new earth. So when does he make this new heaven and new earth? After the final judgment. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The new heaven and the new earth had to be created after the first heaven and the first earth passed away, which all happened at the final judgment. Therefore, the new heaven and the new earth would have to be after the final judgment. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 through 8 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Therefore hell, the unquenchable fire where the worm does not die, is not the realm of the dead, but the final punishment for those who refuse to bow their knee to Jesus while on this earth, in this life. Hell is indeed the lake of fire, the second death. There is no way around it. This now begs the question, why? Why is hell the lake of fire? I believe the author of the book of Hebrews answers this for us. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 31. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him 
who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The author states that it's frightening to fall into the hands of the living God. Why would it be frightening? Well, the author goes on to describe God to us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 through 29. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Moses confirms this as well. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24 says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. God is a consuming fire, and hell is referred to as an unquenchable, eternal fire. Hell is like falling into the hands of the living God falling into the hands of a consuming fire that cannot be quenched. This now makes sense why hell cannot hurt the saints according to Revelation chapter 2, 11 and Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Why? Because our new bodies that we will receive at the final trumpet blast, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 through 56, will have been refined in fire, which is why it's perfect, immortal, and imperishable. Luke chapter 3, verse 16 tells us, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Mark chapter 9, verse 42 through 50 says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sink, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sink, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Everyone must be salted with fire, either willingly or begrudgingly. And we who follow Jesus and heed his warnings and dwell in his love will be safe from his wrath because we are already in his hands. We won't fall into his hands as punishment for our wickedness. John chapter 10 verse 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. The prophet Jeremiah echoes the same sentiments as he describes the Lord as our potter and we as his clay. Jeremiah 18 verse 4 says, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. Therefore, to be thrown into hell will be like falling into the hands of the living God without the protection of being refined in the fire of love and given a new imperishable body. So while you all ponder these things, let's sum everything up real quick. Hell and Hades are two different places. Hades is the realm of the dead that will give up its dead at the final judgment and then will be thrown or casted into the lake of fire. Hell is the unquenchable fire where the worm doesn't die that the wicked are thrown into at the final judgment. It's referred to as the lake of fire because it will be like falling into the hands of the living God who is a consuming fire without first being refined in the fire of his love that ushers you a new imperishable perfect body. I never intended to make this video as long as it is, but I felt it was necessary to address comments to clear up any confusion anyone might have had. On that note, I hope I succeeded and that you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. And until next time, God bless.